Welcome to the Red Diamond Report podcast with your host, Wilton Jackson. And today I have another phenomenal guest. Her name is Coach Reese. Uh, Coach, we've met at the Sports Business Symposium in Atlanta this year back in April. I'm so glad our lives crossed paths. Uh, you know, Coach, just introduce yourself. Tell us, tell the listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do. Coach Reese, uh, that's my street name. I tell everybody full name's Arisa Wilson, um, but they call me Coach Reese because I've been a coach since I was 15. I started coaching basketball. Uh, fifth grade basketball team when I was 15 years old. Like my mom was driving me to practice. I didn't have my license yet or nothing like that. And I just fell in love with it. Yeah. Um, I fell in love with leadership at a very early age. I'm a product of Proverbs is what I like to say. Like just the leadership and the wisdom and that type of stuff. I was like, oh, I love this. So right. I just wanted to figure out how do I help people be and live out their best lives. And so um, that is how I got into coaching hoop was from that aspect. And so I played and I coached pretty much for my entire life. Um, I'm from Tacoma, Washington. Originally I uh, played community college basketball, which is, I love saying that because not a lot of cats understand that CC grind. And I got a heart for, uh, for small ball is what I like to call it. So ended up playing um, CC ball, wasn't highly recruited, um, but I always had big hoop dreams like any hooper. And um, I ended up going to a D2 NAI school after that. I had a lot of other looks, but I needed that small, like kind of village. I needed to be in class and have conversation with everybody in class. And so I um, ended up going that route. And then um, I played pro overseas, thank God. Literally by the grace of God, was I able, that and hard work, you know, I'm gonna say it both sides, you know, <laughs> uh, I worked as hard as if it was up to me and prayed as if it was up to God. But um, so I ended up playing pro overseas and but it was able to play in a couple different countries. Uh, which was amazing and a blessing. But I started a AAU program back in when I was 19, um, 20, um, a nonprofit that way. So I've been an entrepreneur since I was about 19 years old. And golly, I mean, I don't want to go too far into that piece, but who I am, I, I like to identify as a black woman, lesbian believer. Uh, I'm a soulmate. I'm a partner. I'm a bonus mom. Um, I'm a daughter. I'm a granddaughter. I'm a sister. I'm a lover of all things. I'm a foodie and I just, I love helping people about their purpose. And that is, that's the snippet of me before we get into everything else. And I'm just grateful to be here. You you consider yourself as a confidence coach. Sure. That's a really big thing because no matter who you are, big or small, whatever goals you're going after, you have to have the confidence to, to, to dive into that. And one of the things that I noticed more than anything, I guess that stood out to me was when I saw the statement that said, you know, that purpose lies in the intersection of being and becoming. So I want to start with this. It can be hard finding your purpose and distinguishing between like work on the job, you know, kind of feeling as though you can truly walk into your purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes that can be difficult. Um, considering ha considering that, how do you define walking in your purpose from your from your lens? Yeah, um, and I would say too. I like to say more so living uh, so I can make sure I'm inclusive of those who may not be able to walk. Right. right. Um, and I know sometimes in the sports world, I got I got caught up with this from a professional stance. We're trying to create something for a walk on. And then they were like, well, what about those students who can? I was like, oh, shoot. So just always trying to grow in the way that I, I see things and being inclusive of people, which I think for me, I'm going to connect that back to humility, which is connected to the root of confidence. Right where I have to be able, whoever the person is, is going to live out their purpose, is going to live out their purpose confidently. You have to be able to accept humility and be like, you know what, how do I grow in this way? So just something that you made me think about right when you said that, but I think, you know, living out your purpose um, and in my tagline is living it out with confidence is number one, authenticity. <sighs> if you are not authentic, you're not living out your purpose. Because what happens is a lot of times if you're trying to live out your purpose by being somebody else, you're trying to live out somebody else's purpose, which means you're therefore not living out yours. Mm -hmm. And if I don't know who I am, then I can't live out my purpose. Okay. So this is why I say it's at the intersection of being and becoming. The middle aspect of that is doing. And so a lot of folks will say, um, and there's, I, and I, I hate it because there's also a notion that like purpose is overrated. And passion is unnecessary. And that hurts my heart because there's a whole bunch of kids out there who might hear that. And I'm like, no, without passion, people perish. Without hope and a vision, what are you living for? You know what I'm saying? Like my I, my belief is you were born on purpose, with a purpose to live out your purpose. Okay. On purpose, with a purpose to live out your purpose. Within that purpose, one is being, doing, and becoming. 
So being who you are, right where you're at, whoever's listening to this at any point in time, you just being you, that's the authenticity piece. That's the humility piece. That's the self-awareness. Being you, being curious, trying to figure out who am I? What do I like? What do I love? How do I want to add value to the world? How do I want to change the world? How do I want to make it not even the whole world, but my world, exactly. my village? How do I want to add value to that? What feels good? What gives me organic energy? Me just being me. Now, the doing aspect is taking those things that I discovered and putting them into action. I feel, told you I love leadership. I love talking to people. I love purpose. I love that. So that is me putting all those things into action. Basketball was a part of my purpose, and I put it into action as a player and a coach. And now I'm still a coach because that's the transferable skill that I took, and now I'm a confidence coach, right? right. So from that piece, and then the becoming is like, Wow, tomorrow I get, prayfully, I get another chance to be better. I want to be better today than I was yesterday and better tomorrow than I was today. So the potential is that if I get another chance to live this life, thank you, God, from a state of gratitude, but I'm going to get after it, right? And to, to close that gap between who am I and who it is that I was born to be and who do I want to be. And my purpose, it's a forever continuing movement of like the hunger knowing I'm not done yet. With everything you just listed, mm -hmm. you have a bunch of different avenues that you've allowed yourself to to dive into. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure along the way, there was maybe one person, two, two people, multiple people who said, like Coach Reese, like, why are you trying to do three, four or five different things? Why yeah. can't you just yep. pick your lane and try to be your most authentic self? What allowed you to say, you know what? This is my process. This mm -hmm. is my purpose. This is what I'm going to follow. Mm -hmm. allowed you to keep that confidence to do that man okay so you know the saying jack of all trades mm -hmm. um and then a master of none and then the ending is um is better than a master better than a master of none right so for me i like to say i started off being a jack of all trades like i was just whew, everything like what do i want to do the curiosity i was given purpose privilege and what that means is I had a mom who was like, you were born. My mom said it first. You were born with the purpose. Right. She only spoke life to me. She only spoke um, blessings. She only spoke like you were the head and not the tail. You are above and not below. You are a leader. God has his hand over. Like I only heard positive things about me. You mix that with me being an only child in the Leo. Boy, like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know I, know, I know a lot of Leos that are not afraid to go after what it is that they want. So I had all of it put together. Mm -hmm. And so for me, but it was really just that reinforcement that in the development of the ego stage of life, right? Because our egos develop when we're younger. Exactly. And my ego was poured into to a sense of like, I can do what I put my mind to and God is going to provide me with whatever it is that I need. But I also need to make sure I'm grateful and that I work hard and I'm a kind person. That was pretty much it. So I started looking at the world like that. Jack of all trades. Then I became a master of some. So in my early 20s, jack of all trades, I was excited. And I was like, I'm, I'm a, I want to be a master of some. Mm -hmm. Here are the areas that I want to master out of the areas that I was a jack of all trades in. Right. Now I'm like, ooh, I'm an expert in a few. And those are the areas, those are my lanes. I have no problem with being in my specific because there's multiple lanes. I got a freeway. Right. We move in. But the, the, the reason why I say it in that way is because some people want to stay jack of all trades. Cool. That's that, that, that if that is what feels good to you, but it doesn't feel good to me anymore because there's certain levels of leadership. There's certain levels, um, other people I want to empower that I can't stay here as a jack of all trades. And I think that the deeper you grow in understanding your purpose, you should be an expert. And not just because I'm about to be a doctor, but because there's things that I've I've done and I can teach on and I can speak on, not just because I'm an expert, but I have experiential capital. I've done certain things over and over and over. So I can teach you how to do the exact same thing. So I think everybody should get to a level of being an expert in certain ways. Right. And the other part to, to this, to the question of the authenticity is I used to be fake. Mm. Absolutely. I didn't know who I was the whole time. I knew I had a purpose, mm -hmm. but I was fake. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I knew I had a purpose, but I was defensive. I How knew did I had... you find you? Say it again. How did you find you? 
golly, it's an everyday intentional. So the name of my coaching firm is Uish, mm -hmm. and the I stands for intentionally. So once I got intentional about seeing there's a gap, one, there's always been a divide between my faith and my sexuality. So going through high school, college, professionalism, I professionally, I do it, done it, graduated top of my class, played pro, da, 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 all those amazing things, but you're fake. Oh, that hurts. You know what I'm saying? Like that was the thing for me, right? Is is I couldn't deal with not being my true authentic self anymore. And so I had to really figure out how do I allow those, both of my faith and my sexuality not be closeted anymore. The journey of, of closing that gap was like really realizing who am I? Who do I want to be? Does God still love me? And how do I bring all of my worlds into one space that allows me to say, I can no longer walk through this world in an inauthentic way because I will reach, I'm reaching a ceiling that I can't, I can't bust through. Right. And I asked God at one point to break my heart for what breaks yours. Mm. And it was me. And that was the beginning. I was like, Ooh, bet. And that was the, like, how do we do it? Right. A whole lot of self-forgiveness, a whole lot of like working through shame um, my little sister was murdered. My mom passed in her sleep. I tore my knee. I got rot. Like I had gone through some just stuff and I right. was like trying to breathe and you can't breathe and be fake and try to win at the same time. Exactly. So I was like, all right, I got to figure out how do I just grow, but to bring it full circle as I had to, I had to humble myself. I couldn't live off of my winning and money. I had to humble myself and, and go like deep, like, who am I? And, and how do you really want to show up in this world? And once I just got real humble and just took some hits that way, that's it. The, the root of anything for me is humility. How do you navigate failure? Is it is that even possible? to 100%, do? 100 percent. So uh, I keep a, I keep a failure log. I keep a failure log. And that joint got some stuff in it. By being able to keep a failure log, it allows me to sit down and I do it on a quarterly basis um, and or unless something just happens randomly. Um, but a quarterly basis, I'll sit down and I do a personal retreat. And on the personal retreat, we go in. So it's not just failure log, it's also a confidence log, right? Because it's also on the other side. But mentally, I had to move failure back three pieces three steps, right? In the learning aspect and doing aspect. So that's one part. Um, but when it comes to moral integrity, character, actions, money, different things like that, that goes in the log. And when we're looking in the log, um, what happened? Why did it happen? What could I have done better? What was the consequence? Who did I need to help me avoid this? What do I need in the future? Right? Like really just asking myself all those really important questions. So that way I don't repeat the same mistake. Exactly. period right or act as if i'm bigger than and i gotta sit with it i gotta talk to whoever needs to be talked to right and ask for whatever accountability ask for forgiveness all those things that are tough and be vulnerable with myself and whoever else and say okay cool now we gotta keep it moving right and so but when i think about failure and i'm teaching it to any of my call mvps i want you to move failure back to spaces so we put failure first and that's the first thing that people see is I might. No, you will. But it doesn't have to be the first step. So now if I go, I need to know what I don't know. If I'm going to attempt anything new, I need to know what I don't know. My six-year-old just, I'm like, bruh, you only been here six years. You don't know it all. So we even, we have to, and bruh, smart. Like, wow, you one day will know a whole, whole lot because you already know a lot, but you don't know more than mommy and I, right? right? So it's like, if this is a six-year-old, of course this is you at 30. Of course this is you at 22. You know what I'm saying? Of course this is you at 40 because you thought you knew it all at six and now you figured out you didn't. You just been trying to hold this facade up that you did and don't want nobody else to know. So now you're lacking in humility. So you done played yourself so bad, you won't even try nothing new. Because you thought you knew it all for so long. And you've been holding up 
this fake facade that you knew it all. So yeah. let's switch that out and say, okay, cool. I have to first embrace humility. With humility means I'm centering my humanity, which means there's going to be some type of humiliation that's going to occur. Those are my three favorite words, humility, humanity, humiliation. The next piece, when it comes to knowing what I don't know, I have to know what that is. You have to learn first. Right. Then I have to know how to execute on what I just learned. That's step two. Know what I need to know, then execute on what I just learned. Then you execute. Once I execute, that's when the failure happens. Now you're like, oh, snap, I didn't see that. You never did it before. So now failure happens there and then you take it, you repeat the cycle, then you apply what you just learned. I call that experiential knowledge. You add it right back. So now that we move failure all the way out, failure is just a piece in our growth cycle, our confidence cycle that says, okay, I needed this because I go back around and I just don't repeat the same thing. I do the cycle a little bit different. You also have experience in being a skills development coach. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you know, you kind of listed in the beginning, you know, your, your, your entrance to basketball. Mm -hmm. How did basketball, how did you get involved in basketball? One, and then two, what made you interested in becoming a coach away from just playing as an athlete? Yeah. I don't know life without hooping. So I don't, I don't know, remember the inception point because I don't know life without it. I was kind of overweightish in high school. Um, not overweight. I just was bigger. I wasn't conditioned. I wasn't out running. I didn't have like a played AAU, but it wasn't anything like it is now. And so in the only people that believed in me was my mom and my dad. So I wasn't the one that was like, Ooh, yep. Reese, she about to be the one. So nobody latched onto me. My dad was the only person in the crowd that's my baby. He, she got to do it. He like, he just, and, and I was like, I was embarrassed because mm -hmm. I didn't even know I could live up to the thought that he saw in me as a hooper. I ended up going to CC, right? Because I didn't have a left hand. I couldn't shoot. I never did no extra, probably did one extra workout throughout all high school in AAU practices. Like that was it. Once I got to college, I ended up, um, having a 1.95 GPA, almost that look, tell me about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Humility. Our coach did this thing towards the end of the year. So this was a blessing for me. She did this thing and it was like, rank your teammates from one through 15. How many people's on the team? Who do you think needs, uh, should be a start if we had a game tomorrow? Who do you think needs to work harder? Who should be captains? So I'm a freshman. Nobody taught me how to be a successful student athlete. My dad failed out of college uh, and my mom was an athlete. She just, she was a, a, she was got her master's, but she wasn't an athlete. As we get this list, I get it back and I'm looking at it and I'm like, huh, eight, you thought eight out of 15. Okay. A couple of you think that I should start. Nobody thought I should be a captain. Almost everybody thinks I need to work harder. Here's your grades. 1.95 coach is saying, if you don't get these up, you can't play. Oh, hold the phone. Yeah. My life changed that day. Best thing that ever happened to me. We're not having this conversation had I not had both of those fact sheets in front of me. And I said, I bet you I won't be no sucker. That was it. Like it was just there. I literally was like, I guarantee you I'm about to shun and stunt on everybody based off my work ethic. So I just had to figure it out. Like I didn't, again, nobody came in my life that was like, all right, here's how you do it. It was, I'm going to make a way. And that moment I stopped doing everything. I stopped kicking it, smoking, drinking, part of every, I wasn't really out there. I was too afraid to be out there, out there like that. But what the little I was doing, I stopped, started waking up at 4 a.m., got up at four, did a workout, went to school, did my thing, boom, lost weight, changed, stopped eating all types of different things. Like I changed, I like, I fell in love with hard work. I just fell in love with being a monster. Like I just, I studied film. I studied the game. I love teaching it. I love teaching footwork. I listened. I watched just everything because I wanted to eat. You were, so I came back my sophomore year, number one in every, every category. Not one person thought I need to work harder. Not one person thought I, everybody thought I need to be a starter. I was the captain of the team. Like it just complete. And I looked at that and said, 
Bet. This is what I worked for. Bet. You can't tell me hard work from this day forward. Like that became the separator. So I hinged my entire identity on being a hard worker. And then nobody wanted to really do what I was doing. So then I became the trainer. So mm. they're like, can you, can we work out with you? Can we do da 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 da? Yep, let's go. So I started coaching and then it was the leadership and then it was all those different things. And people wanted to work out with me that way. I was getting my degree in personal fitness training. And so I was loving all that kind of stuff. And I just loved being able to be a leader, fusing workouts and hoop at the same time. So then once I get to um, my four year and um, my little sister was murdered my fur, my, my junior year, mm-hmm. I tore my knee. My grandma has a heart attack. My little sister's murdered all within this like super short time frame. And um, I loved AAU and wanted to figure out how I can get after it. And so I started a, sorry, the year before I had a teacher who asked, who are you? And I was like, okay, I'm a true Christian now, now, whatever that means, Mm -hmm. student athlete. So I just started writing that on everything. And then I was like, I want to turn this into a nonprofit. I didn't really know nothing about that. So I taught myself business in that way and started a nonprofit. And um, I was like, and I want to have sports teams. I want to do this. And my mom was like, let's run it. Cause she believed in me, let's do it. So I went out, did everything I needed to do. And at 19, 20 years old, I started a nonprofit in honor of my sister. And it was TCSA, True Christian Student Athletes, a sports specific academic and life skills academy. Hey guys, I'm putting on a team. I have cats show up. So I'm rehabilitating from getting my knee together, training kids for $12 an hour, running the program, ordering gear off the um, um, out the East Bay, scheduling tournaments, doing this. Like I'm just at 20 and I'm like this feels good so that same leadership that same training my knee got better I became a beast came back the next year and just was like again so it just really the hard work the development the pouring in the like sweating when nobody knows and then you just start achieving via social media now people are like that's just who she is what made you transition full-time from the professional athlete to strictly from the coaching aspect. So the hip injury got me um, and I came back and I could have, I could have went, but I just really wanted to be a head coach. I was also going to be a firefighter, fun fact. And I didn't find or follow the firefighter route because it would have kept me from being a coach mm-hmm. and, um, and being a coach as fast as I wanted to be. And I wanted to get to the CC level because it changed my life. So I said, I'm going to be a CC head coach so I can change these young women's lives. I took my philosophy that I created um, from my youth ministry degree, from like a life personal development stance. And I turned that into my program. I took that and put that into my master's thesis and all that. And then I took that into a whole entire packet. And I went and I've been first job interview I got. I got that's the job I got. And it was an amazing school. And I was like, "I, I can't like this is an amazing setup. It's amazing situation. And I want to change lives. I coached AAU last year, but I can't unsee what I know from a human stance now. I can't focus on the game right now. I just, I'm like, no, I want to, like, there's so much more to you than that. I don't want to be that in that demographic right now. I want to be on the on the other side. When you look at today's sports landscape, particularly, particularly in women's college basketball and WBA, there's always the discussion for, more co- more coaches of color, specifically more black coaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your stance on the need for more black coaches in these spaces? Uh, my stance is my dissertation. Um, mm-hmm. So I say that because um, I was one of two black women head coaches out of six levels, all six levels. Mm-hmm. So we're talking D1 all the way down to JUCO, one of two out of seven states on the West Coast. That's right. So Nowhere we went was there another coach because the other coach, she was a D3 coach on the Mm -hmm. opposite side of the state. We're both in Washington. Right. Nowhere else we went. Could you could I look on the other side and there just be that. How are you doing? What's going on? What's up? You you good? Yeah. Wasn't nobody checking on me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like there wasn't any of that. And then I look at my team and I'm like, all y'all look like me intentionally, intentionally. Not only was my faith and my sexuality at odds, my identity as a black human was at odds and suppressed by my faith. 
I was raised in white Christianity in that thought process. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the deconstruction and things like that that are going on now, I had to really do that kind of work too. Right. Because to real rap, like again, I'm not I'm not in any space to be fake. I didn't want to be black. I didn't want to have to like it just was it was kind of foreign to me. And I have an amazing black mom and grandma, but you know, it's just it's kind of different with my mom and grandma because I'm dealing with my sexuality and that Emma is just so many different things. And I went to a small white Christian school when I went away. Mm-hmm. So it just was like, I just went through a lot, but I started to becoming not more woke in this sense, but more like, who am I? And how do I really lead this young group of women that are looking? I was only 25 when I got my first head job. So how am I really leading? I didn't want to be um, uh, a hypocrite leader. I didn't want to be somebody who couldn't really stand so my players and my students taught me not knowing how to be authentically me. And they required me not knowing that if you're going to show up, you better show up as you. So one of two, I'm looking around half of my team or my whole team had more black women on it than the rest of the league combined. So in that, there were certain things that we had to talk about. There were, you know, my leash is shorter than Sally's is. I'm talking to the refs different. I got kicked out of one game off of some. And I was like, I'll never give anybody a reason or a chance to take my love away from me like that again, because you want to be on some power trip. Yeah. Right. So I had to learn real quick. How do I. You know what I'm saying? How do I play the game when you're talking about code switching and being authentic and, and our, um, you know, all of that stuff? How do I play the game without playing myself? Exactly. Right? So I right. had to learn those lessons you know, as a coach and also stand in front of 15 young women and say, I'm not selling myself out and I'm never selling you out. My uh, my dissertation focus is um, is on how do community college basketball coaches use their leadership ability in order to develop different types of capital in black women, college athletes. Mm-hmm. And so I interview coaches um, and I want to continue that work right in other spaces and take that work to teach coaches. All that to say is. We need role models, not only a school hard, but just to be a student. Then these black women are struggling on their campuses because they're dealing with multiple um, identity issues, lack of um, community. Their coaches don't get them. Like, I think if you have if half of your team is um, any type of race, you need at least one or two coaches. But then it doesn't matter if that person is inauthentic and doesn't identify with their race in that way culturally either. If there's going to be black women hooping, then we need black w- men and women coaches. Right. Both. Because not all men are where they need to be from an understanding of sexuality as well. Not all men understand toxic masculinity. Right. right? And, and if their hearts aren't in a specific place from a understanding emotions and how that navigates and just humanity. And not saying all women coaches have it either, right? Like as a human race, there's a lot of things that we need, but we need to be able to see somebody that looks like us in a certain position. Um, I think it's getting better at all levels, but you know, it's nowhere near where it needs to be. A lot of coaches are not trained in human development. And if you weren't developing holistically, it don't matter. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially if you're seeing or you just have a winning record, cool. Put them out there. They know how to win. And if they know how to win, then they're appeasing the top. And it sucks because the athletes are the ones who are the ones doing the work, but also are being treated often, you know, the worst, because this is where mental health comes into play, where, you know, athletes are starting to speak out. But a lot of athletes aren't speaking out because if I do go talk to the counselor, what is my coach going to say? If I do feel like I need a mental health break now, I'm letting my team down. Now I'm doing it. So it's just. Coaches have to have a heart of understanding, of empathy, of like if he or she or they mentally can't go, it's the same way as a a sprained ankle. If the coaches aren't creating a psychologically safe space for athletes, you're not going to get their fullness, which means you're not going to get buy-in, which means your team cohesion is going to be impacted, which means their overall performance is going to be impacted. And regardless, you didn't get what you want to get anyway, so you might as well invest in your players. So that way you can get all of those things. It just takes longer. So if you don't have patience, you're going to be pulling out your crop before it's ready. Humility. 100%. It's funny that everything comes full circle. Absolutely. And when you had the experience of being 
a previous locker room assistant with the Storm. He also was a girls' basketball camp coach at Stanford. I mean, it doesn't get any better than the Seattle Seattle Storm, uh, you know, working with those players, but then also, you know, learning from, from my coach like Tar Vanderveer. What, how did those experiences kind of shape you into you getting into this space that you are now? I'm sitting in the room like this. I'm listening. I got I, I got my notes. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Tara, yeah. Tara, amazing. She would do um, one day at camp. Mm-hmm. Um, she would have all the coaches in a room. Ask me whatever question you want. It just and I I, I wanted to coach the camps for that. Um, as far as the storm, I mean, uh, it, same thing. I'm watching the trainers do their thing. I'm watching the players warm up. How you do footwork? Boom. Yep. So I'm going back to my sessions. Now I seen Brittany Ryder this, like literally, like when she first got in the league, and I was there when they played. Um, the USA team played China, maybe 2012, 13, something like that. And so mm-hmm. I'm like, anything going on, I wanted to be in it. I was going to coaching clinics early at like 20 21 22 getting student scholarships to go to stuff to fly across the country I just wanted to soak it up because again I want to be a master at what I'm teaching because I just got that hunger and I was like I don't like I just want to know because when I speak I want to I want it to be I want it to land I want to switch gears just a little bit the WNBA more specifically has a ton of talent right now Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of great players uh, I want to ask you this now. Granted, you played um, at a certain level. You've coached at a certain level. You have the skills, the skill development piece as well. When you look at some of the the, the really good players right now, the Arikes, the Breonna Stewart's, Asia Wilson's, you know, Ryan Howard's, Aaliyah Boston's, the Aguma case. Like when you look at these type of players from a skill set standpoint, what do you notice about some of their games that make them? those special players? It's a, it's a knack for like, there's that just, it's a, it's a hunger. It's a dog. You know what I mean? When I think like my eyes do this, cause I just feel when I watch some of the cats play, even like Chelsea Gray, right. Um, you know what I mean? Like you're just that those are hoopers. There's a difference between wanting to look like a hooper and really being about that life. The ones you named are about that life. Like I hoop. And I think for me, that's that to me is that that's what makes the game the game. And I think that's why the W needs that much more respect because you got a bunch of hoopers who are hooping. Are you a fan of WNBA players having charter flights for every single game? Do you think they need them? Isn't that what happened? Isn't that what the men do? It is. The other part is too, like I think, had this situation with with Brittany not happen, um, and her um, unlawful detainment. The thing that sucks is a lot of people aren't checking for a lot of WBA players either. So then the argument on the other side is, well, why they're fine? Like, what do you what do you mean these are professionals? When you look at every other sport, even women's soccer, you know. So I I think I think yes because they deserve it. I think that much more now because of NIL and the stardom that is happening. And now you can't, Angel Reese has security. If Angel Reese has security, why would Brittany Griner not? Exactly. That, that should, that should have been my first answer, right? Like the stardom of people is growing because of social media. People think they can, especially after, you know, the insurrection, all those things, people think they can do whatever it is that they want to do right. and, and not be held accountable. So because people are walking with their chest puffed out, a lot of white men, this, that, and the third, you think you want to take situations to your own hands, absolutely protect these women at all costs. If not, then then what? So if you want them to go to bat for you, but you're not going to supply us with with our basic needs, now if my job isn't providing me with my basic needs, now my psychological safety is out the window. Now my psychological well-being is dropped. I can only imagine how terrifying that was for her. That impacted everything. So all the work that she may have done could have just she's a trauma, PTSD, right in there. Now what happens? Basketball is is you. Like you, 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 you didn't remember anything in your life where a time or you hadn't had any point point in your life where basketball was not important. If you could engage in a pickup game, you're you're in the game. 
You have four of the players that you have to pick on your team, past or present. What four would they be and why? So Tamika, Candice, KT. Um, I would then go with, oh, Brittany, four. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, this is hard. And I love that it's hard because, I mean, I don't want nobody to take my spot, my position. So I, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, obviously, there's Skylar, there's uh, Dewana Bonner, who's a Hooper. There's, you know, Alyssa Thomas, who does, you know, amazing things. There's uh, Jocko. I mean, there's just so many dope women Hooper. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop right there just because I don't want to play it. I want to watch it, you know, like a tough, all, like just be at a pickup game right. with them cats. You know, and just watch them go at it. Yeah. <laughs> and that thing back to your question a couple questions ago is just they make you love and be engaged. Well, Coach Reese, I want to ask you this before I let you go. Yep. Um, are there any upcoming projects that you're working on? And also where could listeners and viewers uh you know follow you and stay connected with you? Yes, best way to stay connected with me is um uh, TikTok number one. At uh, Coach Reese, no E at the end, one um, IG. You can follow my personal page and my uh, my Uish page, uh, which is I'm dropping stuff on both of them on a daily basis. Obviously, personal stuff, you're going to see me, my family, my my uh, my queen, things like that. Um, Uish, I'm dropping you know, as much motivation and encouragement as I can. Projects, yeah, finishes dissertation, so you can buy that at some point. Um, the <laughs> other piece is. Um, future courses and teaching on really helping people take what's going on. Um, I've got a podcast, Practice the Podcast with Coach Reese. That's on all platforms, um, video on YouTube. And then I'll be coming out with a new show called Money and Money Ain't Everything. We're breaking down leadership, um, tricks of the trade, culture. I always want to fuse research and culture um, into two pieces. So now those are the things that's coming. It's only up from here. So there'll be books dropping in the fourth quarter and you know, that kind of stuff, but just stay tuned. I just want to help you live out your purpose with confidence. So that's it. Absolutely. With Coach Reese, I truly thank you for coming on to the show and we will be speaking again soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. You keep being great, period. Will do.